What will keep your heart rate down is breathing through your nose, okay? Because you're actually getting 20% more oxygenation of your tissues by breathing through your nose. It was five days. And by day three, I was up a mountain. It was like minus 20 degrees and I was in a bikini having fun. The urge to breathe does not actually come from a lack of oxygen. It comes from a buildup of carbon dioxide. I just thought, you know, breathing, you do breathing. Like, what are you going to teach me about breathing kind of thing? I was doing it and all of a sudden I just like flooded with tears. We have a quick favour to ask you. Each week, we want to make this podcast better and better. But to do that, we need your help. If you're watching on YouTube, could you spare us one second and click that subscribe button? And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, please follow us and rate the show. It will really, really help us to keep bringing you these conversations each week to get you out on those runs and help you hit your running goals. Thank you. Welcome back to 5 Miles Easy. On today's show, we are joined by Ainit Lombard. Ainit's background was in neuroscience, as well as having been an elite level tennis player for several years, which sparked her interest in how breathwork and cold exposure can influence performance and overall health. Steph, this is such a fascinating conversation. I've been so excited to share it with our listeners because I have to say, breath work in particular is something I was a little bit skeptical about but having had this conversation with Ainet it makes so much sense and it's one of those things it's like how was I ever skeptical about it because the science is there and it is just so logical. Yeah the funny thing I found with the conversation was as you said it seems so obvious and it's no secret because we all breathe but it's having the knowledge of how you can control your breath that can really impact how you both feel physically and mentally, which I found so fascinating. And the amazing thing is it's actually really easy to control. It's not something that you need to work at for a year to see benefits. It's basically instant and it's something that we can all do today. I think I've mentioned before on the podcast how I've never done a proper breathwork course or anything, but from some advice from my sports psychologist when I was getting stitches in races, and he just said, well, why don't you just try on the start line to slow down your breathing, relax a bit more, and see if that does anything. So I implemented that, and I noticed the effect straight away. I've never had a stitch in a race since. And I was like, well, this is no coincidence. So it just showed me that actually, when you're a bit nervous, you're not thinking necessarily about your breath because it can be so subconscious, but you can make it conscious. Mm. So taking back the control of your breathing, slow breaths, like really deep, just will relax your whole body. So having had that experience, are you now tempted to see what else you can do with yeah. breath work? Because you've already seen such a positive Well, that outcome. was it. But I think you don't know what you don't know. So it was almost like, okay, well, I know that helps that, but what else? can you do so I think the conversation with Ain it really opens that up into actually how much benefit you can get from taking control of your breath mm, yeah definitely and cold exposure too I feel like it's quite a hot topic at the moment ice baths and everything but yeah. it's so interesting to actually get into the science of how it works and how to do it properly because I have to say I I've been getting quite into ice baths recently but I realized I've been doing it wrong so I'm not going to spoil it any more than that <laughs> but I've been doing it wrong <laughs> Did you know, have you just been doing it how you think you should or have you, did you have any advice before? No, I just it? got in. Okay. <laughs> and then you knew that you needed to try and like control the breathing that would help you feel better, but not much more than that. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a quite instinctive. You get in and you, you get that shock reaction, but to push through it, you kind of automatically control your breathing and control your mind to mm. not jump out. Yeah. Well, I have to say the conversation did make me quite tempted to try some cold plunges. We heard it on the pod. We did. And also the combination of both breath work and cold exposure, how they can work together. Yeah. I mean, they. I think for to make cold exposure work, as we find out, breath work is so essential. But shall we find out more from Ainit? Let's. Ainit. Thank you so much for joining us for Five Miles Easy. We are really, really excited to get into the world of breath work and cold exposure. It's such an interesting topic for us. But firstly, it would be great to know what do you do and why do you do it? Um, so I work with people and make science practical for human health. So that's either working one-on-one -on -one with an individual or workshops 
or um, retreats. And so the main modalities that I use in that in that health and science uh, relationship are breath, movement, cold exposure. Um, so those are the main things that I put together when I'm doing either workshops or working with people uh, one-on-one. So, yeah. And how did you get into that? Um, <laughs> that is a good question as well. So I, I've i always been interested in the worlds of health and performance. So when I was younger, um, I played a lot of sport and then I was uh, competitive in tennis and a uh, few other sports, but mostly tennis. And so I was always interested in like how to improve your health and performance um, in that aspect. And then I, um, I studied neuroscience, so I was kind of putting things together with that. But then after I did that, I uh, heard this like uh, random podcast actually quite a few years ago with uh, Wim Hof. And I thought I knew quite a lot about health and wellness and la la la. And uh, then he was talking about different things and I thought he was a bit nuts, to be honest. And he is a bit nuts, actually. Um, and he was talking about breath work and cold exposure. And I really don't like the cold. So I was like, all right, this is a bit weird. And he was saying certain things and I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. And he was saying that, oh, there was this research that back in the day that they did this uh, experiment where they had like uh, over 100 people come into a lab. I don't know if you guys have heard of this endotoxin experiment. No, 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 not familiar. So anyway, they had all of these uh, people come in. It was like, yeah, over 100. And they injected them with the bacteria. Okay. And this bacteria makes you sick, makes you feel like shit, right? For about three to four hours, right? It gives you like fever-like symptoms and all this kind of stuff. And so they injected these people everyone had the same result three to four hours they felt pretty miserable and then they were fine and uh, at the time Wim was this like a uh, Guinness World Book of Records kind of run he ran up uh, past the death zone in Everest in just a pair of shorts so he was kind of like the ice man right so they decided to do the same experiment with him and so they injected him with the endotoxin and within 15 to 20 minutes, he was fine. And they were like, yeah, yeah, but he's an ice man. He's a bit of a freak of nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then this was the first time that for him, it sort of sh- shifted. And instead of just doing these records and whatnot, that he decided, no, 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 I can teach other people how to do this, right? So the scientists were skeptical and they were like, all right, well, we'll give this guy a shot, whatever. So they got 20 people who had never met him, never been injected with the endotoxin. And they they decided to go training with Wim in Poland. So in the mountains, really nice area. And they did four days training with Wim. So they did the breath work They did the cold exposure and the mindset training. That is part of the Wim Hof method. And uh, then they came back to their normal lives in the Netherlands so they could train or they didn't have to train, whatever it was. And then I think it was on the ninth day after meeting him, they went in and did the same experiment as the others. And what happened was, you know, spoiler alert, the same same thing. So within 15 to 20 minutes, they were fine, right? So at the time I was living in Dubai, so not too much uh, access to the old cold. And Wim was a bit of a new phenomenon as well. So it was like sort of bringing attention to him. It wasn't wasn't much. It was a bit neat. It was pretty niche. So this was, I think it was 2015 when I first heard of him. And uh, yeah, and then I tried some of the breath stuff myself and I was like, mm, it's quite interesting. But then I was also pretty skeptical of this particular paper that they issued from this um, this experiment. And I was like, yeah, but maybe like, you know, Wim's just a very charismatic dude, you know, like maybe it's just like that sort of guru effect or like placebo, right? So I go, okay, well, I'm here. I hate the cold and I was in Dubai, so I wasn't even practicing any of the cold as well. And I said, you know, I'll go as a participant and see if it's all bullshit, right? So I went to Poland and it was with Wim. It was with a group of people. It wasn't, uh, so it was Wim and then it was other like smaller little groups. <laughs> and uh, like the first day I was like, oh, Aneth, what the fuck are you 
done like like you know what is this like you hate the cold why are you here this is a bunch of weirdos this is like this is weird right like this is too far ain't it this is like too far so anyway the first dip I had was like oh my god what am I doing right I was like my toes I was in the river uh, why not and the guy who was actually in charge of my group was real hard ass which was actually perfect for me because I come from that like competing aspect and I was like yeah you know like and so it got like you know it was only a short it was five days and by day three I was up a mountain it was like minus 20 degrees and I was in a bikini having fun Mm. and uh, like this was like bizarre for me right and then I had like a breath session with Wim and like um I remember it was uh it was like a group maybe like 60 people total it wasn't that big and uh I was in the corner I was like looking out of the snow and I just thought you know breathing you do breathing like you know what are you going to teach me about breathing kind of thing and I was doing it and all of a sudden I was just like flooded with tears right and I was just like where did they come from like what what is all of this right and Wim's there playing his guitar he's got a little you know hat on and <laughs> like a where's Wally hat on and he just like almost looks at me and gives me this like kind of knowing stare and I'm like yeah and I'm like smiling and I'm like happy but also tears and I was just like all right there's something to this like just by changing your breath in certain ways it like gave me so many um, different experiences like it wasn't just this one experience it was different completely different experiences on different times and then with the cold and me like it was just pretty wild Right. So I had like this like five day like adventure that was, I mean, it's so cliche to use, isn't it? Like to say it's like life changing and whatnot, but it was pretty, pretty wild. Right. And then on a separate tangent. So before this particular trip, I had been having issues with my period. So uh, in my last year of training and competing, I trained like I completely destroyed my body. So one of the effects of that was actually not having periods, right? So it's kind of a common thing, but for tennis, actually, it's not as common as, let's say, running or something like this. Um, But I really crushed it, right? And not in a good way. And one of the signs that that was the case was losing my periods. So the first bit, it was maybe like three or four months where I didn't have a period. And then it got longer and longer. And then it was just before going to Poland. I don't think I'd had my period for just over a year. So it was like a year and a month or a year and two months or something like this, right? And I was I was starting to get really worried about it. So I was like going to, you know, people and seeing what, what could be done. And to the point actually where there was one uh, <laughs> a consultation with a doctor who suggested it possibly could have been early menopause, which was very scary, especially when they said it on the last like, five minutes of the consultation um but anyway so I sort of put that sidetracked it a little bit to the side and was like all right I'm just going to Poland whatever I don't I'll deal with that afterwards pretty much right so anyway went to Poland (laughs) this is wild shit right and then I uh I came back and I was feeling good obviously but uh probably like a week or 10 days after I got back uh, I got my period back for the first time. So over a year, almost a year and two months. And I was like, ah, okay. Wow. So there was like this sort of mismatch of expectations and real reality. And also sort of like trying to get my head around why, you know, I'm mm. just like quite a curious person. And these things just didn't seem to quite fit, right? So this is a a long, long extended version of why I got into this. But I guess for me, the the Wim Hof method was my first kind of venture into the alternative breath, uh, respiratory. It was my gateway drug um, into the breath world. And uh, then it was sort of getting to use my background which I had, but we didn't really th- talk about breathing at the time. Like it was, it was non-existent and putting these pieces together. Okay. So, all right, this happened. Right. And so many people have like all of these anecdotes that they have 
of like, yeah, this, you know, this autoimmune condition that I had, you know, disappeared or, you know, my diabetes was, you know, all of these, so many different things. And it was starting to, yeah. And for me on a personal level, like starting to piece together, why could this be the case? Or maybe, you know, uh, using my health background um, and yeah, my practical experience then as well. So what is, what is the Wim Hof method taking back? Is it like a certain way of breathing? Is there a method to it? Is it more like a way of thinking? That is, that is an inter- that is a good question. I would say it's both. It is a there is a specific protocol to the Wim Hof style breathing. Uh, so the to give you a bit of a rundown. So the Wim Hof method is three pillars. So you got the mindset component, which go addresses your way of thinking. There's the breath work uh, component, so the breathing component, and then there's the cold exposure, and together. They're, they intermingle, but they can also be separate. What 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 are they like? What's the breathing and what's the mindset and what's the yeah cold? Okay, so the cold exposure is very flexible. Yeah, okay. in terms of different ways that you can expose yourself to the elements, to changes of thermal regulation and whatnot. And so that's a little bit you know more flexible in terms of definition. Uh, the breathing is a specific protocol, which is um, is always done in a safe space. It's never done like while you're, you know, moving or it's always lying down. And because it's an intense breath work. And so it's a couple of rounds of combining higher intensity breath work than your normal day to day breath work or breathing, sorry, combined with breath holes. Yeah. Mm. And so you're having the both sides of your nervous system, if you will, activated. Higher mm-hmm. intensity being long breaths. Uh, so Deep deeper breaths. and faster than your normal right. breathing. Okay? okay. So you wouldn't be going around like this, breathing <gasps> like this all the time. Yeah. In fact, it would be detrimental to your health if you were. <laughs> um, but having small dosages of these kind of short term stressors can have quite interesting effects on your on your well-being and your health. And then uh, the last comp- uh, the the last pillar, the mindset, really I would say brings both elements together because you start to really um, think differently by being exposed to these two elements, but also we really have no idea what what potential we have as humans. I mean, Wim has has all of these records. Now I don't give it monkeys whether I do the the records that kind kind of records that he has. So like two hours in ice bath, you know, in an ice. For me, I'm I'm not too pushed. That's all right. <laughs> I don't need that. Okay, but there are aspects to our own physiology that we have. We're we're not even close to you know realizing or realizing our potential. Um, whether you want to be two hours a night, not my cup of tea, but, you know, there are so many ways that, and he's kind of like a, the image for things that you think you can't do. Mm. And actually a lot of people think they can't do an ice bath. And then they go in and they actually realize, actually, it's not so bad, you know. So is that the mindset's kind of about exploring your limits, whatever you think they are and pushing beyond them, whether that's, you know, just even getting into the ice or yeah so limits in terms of yeah uh, what you can do how you approach it yeah and it gives you so much confidence <clears throat> and you can do things that you thought that you couldn't do mm, it's so interesting because I think linking back to breath often I know when just thinking about ice baths I I used to hate the cold I never thought I could yeah. do them and actually it was kind of breathing through it yeah. that gets you gets you gets me into the ice bath Mm -hmm. and I think we do it so often without even thinking about it using our breath to calm us and kind of overcome challenges that we're scared of or think we can't do and it's like right take some deep everyone's told to take deep breaths and it's sort of something that we just say but don't really think about and and we also do the opposite Mm. so we change our breath and it gets us into elevated states that are like not useful you know yeah so 
it's knowing also that you've got um, a tool like available to you at any moment that you can change your state and mm-hmm. that's kind of wild yeah so for, for you I mean it's just incredible that after over a year of not having a period that yeah. after doing yeah. all of this work it it came back do you think it's so is the combination needed so the breath work combined with the cold exposure was the combination of that what happened on a neurological level that helped your body um so it's an interesting one whether it's the combination or whether it's more one Mm -hmm. more the other um, and people generally tend to ask those kind of questions for me I think the breath is super important because I you know we don't always have access to cold exposure or whatever like like this and also cold exposure may not be useful all the time you know there's different tools for different uh, things yeah so you don't you know hammer use a hammer when you need a you know, a screwdriver, right? Um, So these are super potent tools. I think if I were to analyze what happened in my situation, there's there's many ways that you can look at both of these um, protocol, like both of both of these medium uh, tools, let's say cold and breath. And you could look at it in terms of your endocrine system, your cardiovascular system, you name it, right? So for me, the lens that I look through is the nervous system because the nervous system is kind of like the boss of all the other systems. Yeah. So it's the boss of your cardiovascular system, it's the boss of your endocrine system. And each system is doing what it needs to do if the big boss is happy. Yeah. So if the big boss is like not so cool, then nothing happens at a local level. Yeah. I tend to look at both the cold and the breath through this lens. And the reason I choose to do this is because it's probably also the easiest to explain. So in both circumstances, you are uh, driving your system for short periods of time into higher stress. And then what has to happen after you expose yourself to a short period of time of higher stress, what has to happen? Presumably you have to get into lower stress. Exactly, right? So you have to rebound, right? So for example, if I pull a bow and I pull it just enough, it comes back, yeah? So is that something you actively have to do or will your body always do that for you? Like, will it always get back to that status or can you actually put yourself in high stress for like too long because you're not actively going into low stress? Yes. Yeah, Yeah. so the dosage is key, right? So for example, in my case, when I was overtraining, I was overtraining, overtraining, and that's chronic, right? So your body's like, all right, (laughs) <laughs> I'm not going to work. That's it, right? And so knowing the dosage will tell you how how much you can push and how, how little you can push, right? But the key, I think, for the breath and the cold, which I didn't know when I was training back in the day, is that you, like I, I would take this, take ownership though of this, is that I can overtrain and I can hide in the gym. I can push my body to certain levels. Now, if I was in that same state and I did a breath practice or I did an ice bath, (laughs) good luck. Your body really feels that, right? Mm -hmm. So getting back to this idea of like, you know, pulling, 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 pulling. Yeah. And then pulling the bow. Sorry, I should say this in case this is just audio. So you're pulling the bow and there's a tension. If you pull it too much, it breaks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you pull it just enough, just enough stress, then your body has to re rebound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you always want to have a a nice range for how, how you operate. Okay. So you want to be, so we, we talk about two different states, alertness and calmness. Yeah. And you want to have a a wide uh, bandwidth for that. Yeah. If you're always kind of nudging towards stress, then you can get stuck there and you get sick. Yeah. In the same way, if you're always nudging towards really like low energy, like, yeah, super low energy, then that's also a a state of illness, right? So you want to be able to fluctuate throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your month, uh, throughout these, these spaces. Now, if you're, if your operating system is only in a very narrow bandwidth, okay, then anything that's stressful 
pushes you off the li limit. Or if you're doing it chronically, you get pushed off the limit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Same thing if you're always in this sort of lower state, then, then you will get sick or it's, uh, it's, you got, you haven't got much wiggle room, right? Now, when you expose yourself to cold or different breath practices that are challenging, let's say, then you start to expand this uh, bandwidth. For example, the, the specific breathing, breathing protocol that is used in the Wim Hof method is 30 to 40 deeper and faster breaths than is normal. Yeah, for you. Okay. So would you say that is more alertness or more calm? Alert. Okay. So you're driving your system in one direction. Now we could also switch that word of alertness into sympathetic arousal, right? Oh, you know, not everyone knows the lingo, right? So you got sympathetic and parasympathetic. So you're fight and flight and you're rest and digest. Yeah. So initially what you're doing in that first aspect of the, the breathing protocol is you're shifting it towards your state of high arousal, okay, of high alertness and your state of stress. Then when you exhale and hold, you take a breath hold. Now, would you say that is more towards the alertness or the calmness? Calm. Calmness, okay. So, you'd, so you're expanding this, so you're going in one direction in an extreme way and then you're going boom in the other direction and so you start to open up your window of tolerance. Does that mm, kind of make yeah. sense on a nervous system level? Mm -hmm, yeah. So sometimes I use this with like a yoga mat or something. And so it's like you go one way, then you go the other way, the yoga mat's rolled up and then you start to unfurl it, right? And so before what used to be your normal bandwidth is now way more expansive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? And what about the cold? How does the cold affect? Okay. So almost exactly on the same platform like bandwidth let's say when you're in the cold initially okay what how which which direction are you going alert to the alertness yeah. right so you're shifting into sympathetic arousal high states of stress and then what has to happen in the cold it comes back the other way it is it's very off, calming first, exactly okay so first off though what has to happen when you're in the cold if you're in there, if you're going to stay in there, because you, initially your body's like going, get me out of here. Mm. This you is not yeah. breathing, right? Yeah, control. So initially you're high, high stress. And then once you say to your body, no, we're going to be in here for a while. Don't worry, it'll be fine. You know, we won't be in there for too long. You know, it'll be all good. Then you have to go into calm because you're in a cold circumstance. What do you have to do when you're in a cold circumstance? Just evolutionary speaking. Not panic. <laughs> Not panic, yeah, because what does panic do? Yeah, increase your breathing, yeah, so you so breathe Okay, even, even using more energy. Basic. Using energy, okay. Yeah. So okay. Your, your, your body has to go from, oh my God, what are you doing? Don't be so stupid, get out of here, to, oh, okay, we're doing this. All right, let's slow everything down. I find it so that it's so interesting because as we've spoken of it on this pod, I'm now quite into my ice, ice baths, which is a fairly new thing. But it's uh, what I find really interesting is the physiological shift. Like you actually, yeah. I've I get that shock reaction, but then I feel calmer. But not only do I feel calmer, I feel warmer. Yes. Like I don't feel cold anymore. Yeah. After about a minute, and yeah. then I'm like, well, actually, I could stay in. Apart from my feet, my feet are the only thing that gets it. Hands, for me. Yeah, yeah, I can keep my hands out, but my feet are the things that stop yeah. me staying in longer. But apart from that, I feel like not that cold. Yes. So it's a real physiological shift. Chain. Well, I don't know. Is it a physiological shift, or is it actually just in my head? One hundred percent. It's it's one hundred percent a physiological shift. But also, what what do you notice when you have have that shift? Just physiologically speaking, I'm just calm. Okay, go even more basic. What happens in your body when you're calm? Relax. My muscles relax. Okay, your muscles relax. That's a that's a good thing. What else? <laughs> <laughs> we're like so close no you're gonna have to tell me no no you're you're working with this you're working with this so you're getting in so initially what happens shock how does my shock breathing, manifest okay breathing so your is, breathing goes yeah <gasps> yeah yeah and then what happens 
Those first couple of seconds are you challenging. You stop moving. Right? You stop yeah. moving. Okay. And then, then I take, well, I take the deep breaths as I'm getting in, mm -hmm. but I really have to force this at first. I have to yeah. force the deep yeah. breaths and stop myself going <gasps> like yeah. that. Yeah. And then it actually just comes naturally. So I start breathing slowly and it's, it's actually, I go into like involuntary, I go into a kind of meditative state. Yeah. I can't really think about much else. That's a funny thing, yeah. But it's just thing, real, yeah. like, clarity. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you're thinking of, ooh, well, what'll I have for dinner? Although that is a good benchmark to see how 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 talented your your ice bathing skills are. It's like, ooh, what'll I have for dinner tonight? You know, instead of, <laughs> all right, get out of here, get out of here. Um, but yeah, so you cannot think of anything else. Because mm. it's a, a super, pro like, a primal experience. Yeah, so back in the day, you know, we were exposed to these kind of temperature shifts. And so, but you going back to what, like under, under everything, when you experience that shift of going from, oh, fuck, what am I doing? To getting in to, oh, I feel quite calm and it's quite like meditative and really nice. Your breathing changes. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. And so yeah. your breathing changes, your heart rate changes. Your breathing is the switch to everything. Yeah, it's like there's two different um, inputs to your, well, inputs and outputs, right? So the input to your brain is going, I am in an ice bath, I need to get out, this is not comfortable, yada, yada, right? Now, if you have the, the input from your body breathing in a calm way, it says, nah, nah, brah, I'm on a beach in Hawaii, it's all good, mate, you know? <laughs> And so there's like a conflict, right? It's like your brain is going, get out, get out, get out, you know, and sur survival. It's just a really smart system, right? But you're breathing in a way that's going, nah, all good, all good. So that that conflict eventually is, is always resolved by your body, okay? Your body is a far mm. stronger input to your physiology the, the output of your physiology than your thoughts, let's say. And we can, you know, put that in a different context. Let's say you're having an argument. That's a high stress circumstance. But if you can shift and learn how to shift your breath in that moment, it gives a better response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because then you start to see the options and instead of reacting, you are responsive. And so I think learning how to be in those states of like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, in, a, in an ice bath, and then learning how to calm it down, you actually, one, you get a really good appreciation of your body and know exactly what's going on in different circumstances and st high stress and lower stress, whatnot. But you also are able to deal with stress a little bit better. Yeah, it's so fascinating because actually our last episode was all on mindset and uh -huh. it's about how mindset can influence how you feel in your body, but actually the other way around as well, 100%. in terms of taking control of something physical can change your mindset. Mm -hmm. it, and I would argue more so, mm. but oftentimes our mindset wins because we just are like stuck thinking thoughts and whatnot. And so we don't actually also have an appreciation of how your breath can change and shift you into other states. Yeah. That makes sense. That, no, that does, that makes a lot of sense. And if, so if our breath can affect how we deal with say an ice bath yeah. and actually change our physiological state, how can it help with psychological disorders? However severe, whether that's, you know, anxiety or, or much more serious kind of psychological yeah. issues. In all of those issues or circumstances, your breath will change. It's, it's inherent. Anytime you have any physical ailment or issue, your breath changes because it's responding to the, to the circumstances that you're in. Now, your breath is happening all of the time. Right now, we're all passengers of our breath. We're not consciously thinking about our breath, right? But and it's part of our autonomic nervous system. So the things that always happen, right? My digestion is working, you know, my heart rate, my blood pressure. I can't just go to my, you know, to my digestion. Hey, buddy, could you um, 
speed up with lunch because I got to go for a run, you know? <laughs> so you don't have that capacity, right? And the same with your heart rate. You can't be like, heart rate, come on, slow down, chill, you know? Uh, so all of those processes are happening, okay? Now, the thing with your breathing, it's happening, but you can also take control of it. Yeah, so it, it's dual control. You can be a passenger and you can also nip into the driver's seat and take control of your breathing, which will change how you feel. Really nice phrase I like to use quite often is um, how you breathe is how you feel and how you feel is how you breathe. So if you ever want to change one, mm. you change the other. Now, that's a kind of a simplistic thing. But when you actually experience your breath in different states, you actually start to notice what you can do in different uh, scenarios, situations, uh, in different health states to shift your breath and therefore shift how you feel. So has it, has, have breathing techniques actually been used to kind of cure people? Uh, cure is a strong word, <laughs> um, but 100% to help, yes. And by, even if you just think of like something really simple, you can use your breath to make you feel good, right? In, mm -hmm. in a very short period of time, right? And if you can do that regularly, that's kind of wild. And you're just pulling together things where you feel good and your body knows, oh, it's safe to, to respond. Your immune system is safe to work. Um, all of these systems are safe because your nervous system is going, I'm safe. I can I can respond to whatever outside stressors there are. I think what you're saying there is we can if you do it incrementally, really what it's focused on, you know, you can change your state, make yourself feel better. And if you can stack that day on yeah. day, then it becomes the cure. Yeah. Basically. For for anxiety, psychological stress, psychological mm. disorders that make us feel not good. Yes, and also getting really back to a really crucial aspect is that by tinkering, let's say, with your breath in different practices, different protocols and whatnot, you actually really get an, a, a very good understanding of your body, which mm. I would argue we don't have. <laughs> um, I, I used to think, oh, I have, you know, I play sport, I'm, you know, I understand my body whatnot. When I first got introduced to breath work, I realized I had not a Scooby-Doo what was going on in my body. It was like, it was a completely different world. You know, I could operate certain physical uh, manifestations of what I wanted to do, but my understanding of my body in general was horrendous. And I thought I had a good understanding. A quick shout out for our new initiative, Boldly. As two female runners, we know the challenges of getting out when it's cold and dark through the winter months. And unfortunately, it's not always safe. That's why we started Boldly, a community and a movement to make running safer for everyone. Join our community by heading to our Instagram or TikTok at Boldly Run. That's B-O-L-D-L-I Run. And if you're London based, join our weekly run club. We meet in Putney every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. So if breath work is helpful for i guess our overall long-term health are there any specific techniques that you would recommend that people try doing that would help them or is it more working out what what works for you so is that is a good question and uh, what i tend to sway towards is this idea of principles over protocols so there's like certain protocols, like the Wim Hof method is a protocol. Um, I also do other other breath stuff like oxygen advantage, like apnea and, and whatnot. They are protocols, right? But if you understand a little bit more the, the wider aspect of breathing, the, the wider, um, the, the principles of breathing, then you can start to go, ah, oh, okay, this, this protocol might be useful in this circumstance or this protocol might be useful in this circumstance. Um, the good thing about breathing is, let's say, let's say I change your nutrition. How long do you think it would take for at least you to understand whether it's working or not? 
few weeks. At least, right? Like at least a month for you to go, oh yeah, okay, yeah. If I tinker also with your training plan, and say, how long do you reckon it tell, you can... Yeah, same. It takes quite a while, right? Now, if I tinker with your breath, and if we explore your breath, you'll know, yeah? You'll know pretty much instantaneously whether it works or doesn't work for you in that moment or that instance, right? Like if we, like, okay, perfect. Okay, I like that question. (laughs) Okay, so for example, let's try something. First off, I want, I'm, we're gonna get you to breathe in for four seconds and out for four seconds. Ideally through the nose if you can, okay? okay? We'll just do a couple of those together. And you know, if whoever's listening wants to do this as well, they can do that. Okay, so we'll just do it together. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, and out, and in, and out, two, three, four. And just check in with your state as it is right now. Yeah? So you just check, oh, okay, heart rate, more or less, body tone, you know, different aspects, okay? All right, let's just imagine that's your baseline, right? It's probably a bit more chill than you would normally be because, you know, but hey-ho, all right? Now what we'll do is we'll do another rhythm. So we'll inhale for four seconds, we'll hold for five seconds, and we'll exhale for six seconds, right? Yeah, soft hold, not like your, yeah? Okay, but it's soft hold, all right? Okay. So in through the nose and ideally out through the nose if you can, but if you have to exhale through the mouth, no worries, okay? So in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, hold, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, six. All right, just check in with your state. Do you feel more relaxed than the last one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, a little bit more relaxed. All right, mm-hmm. cool. <laughs> okay. I'm a bit like, woohoo. Okay, cool. Now let's try something. You're going to inhale and exhale through the mouth, and it's going to be quite fast. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So just through the mouth. <sighs> yeah? Yeah. All right. Okay. On my count. All right. Okay. In, out. 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 In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, stop. Okay, check in with your heart rate. Okay, how do you feel? Yeah, that's, that, I mean, that feels stressful when you're doing stressful, it. Stressful, yeah. alertness. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, your heart rate changes. Yeah. yeah. Instantaneously. Mm-hmm. All of those practices were less than a minute. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you can just start to shift and explore your breath. Yeah. And shift your state in the direction that you want. Mm. So I was just yeah. doing that then with s- slow followed by fast. So the calming effect followed by the stressful effect. Uh-huh. Is that widening the, I can't remember how you described Ooh, it. That is a good point. I didn't think about it like that. But yes, potentially, yes. Doing one after the other. Exactly. But even more like broader lens than this. I like lenses. This image of lin- lenses is quite <laughs> useful for me. But I, I like that point. But in order for you, so going back to the ideas that we were exploring before, so you got one side of your nervous system, alertness, and one side of your nervous system, calm. Okay, this is a tiny exploration. We could, I mean, we could spend a month here and we wouldn't even scrape the surface of breathing. It's really (laughs) cool. Breath nerd over here, hash. Um, So you've you've got like alertness and calmness, yeah? if you were to think about this in terms of your breath, how do you need to breathe in order to get more alert? Faster. Okay, so the, faster, yeah. what else? Through your mouth. 
Bingo. Yeah. What else? Shallower. Like bingo. Up upper chest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Last one. You get ten points if you get this one. <laughs> <laughs> High stakes. With your eyes open. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, that's a good one because I do like my nervous system and the visual system, but not okay. what we're working with now. This one's trickier, harder. Tell us. Okay, is it more focused on the inhale or the exhale? Inhale. Bingo. Okay. So if I want to get my state more alert, I breathe faster, breathe through my mouth, breathe upper chest, and focus on my inhale. Now, what is the question? Okay. But if we want to bring <laughs> our state into more relaxed, what do we need to do? The opposite. Bingo. So breathe through my nose, breathe into my lower lower chest and my diaphragm okay breathe slower yeah and focus on the exhale yeah okay, okay. so there's a nice little phrase relaxation is in the exhalation mm, okay interesting yeah. activation is in the inhalation you'll remember <laughs> that sorry about that <laughs> and how how long so so if we're in a really heightened stress state yeah either because of Hard physical exercise or, you know, had a yeah. massive argument with your partner. Yeah, they're all the same. Yes. And you're like, right, I really need to calm my system down. How yeah. how long would you have to do that breath work for it to kick in? You can try it yourself and you'll notice how quickly your body responds to a slower breath. It's incredible. It's so weird that we just don't know these tools are literally like underneath our nose. Yeah. Like nature has hidden it really well, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. I want to get into some of the some of how it can affect performance because when we were doing that shallow breathing <clears throat> exercise that made me think of running like I yeah. felt like I was running yes and we've all especially in races I think I know Steph you've struggled with stitches and you think it's to do with yeah breathing. breathing and I'm just thinking like how and actually this is a really interesting question from you because you discover breath work after your professional your performance tennis career, you know, performance yeah. in tennis, how do you think it can actually help perf athletic performance? And like, what can we do yeah. to use breathing to actually perform better? Yeah. And this is like, I kind of wish I knew, you know, things I wish I knew in school, right? Yeah. You know, that's generally my little hallmark, you know. <laughs> the, the breath is key for me. It mm. controls everything, right? So the aspects though that I would like kind of kind of box them is recovery um, during as well when you're competing like we were talking about earlier of you know when different situations arise what you can do um, and then training wise right in terms of performance because you guys are into running and, and performance in general athletic pursuits um, the 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 most useful thing is to build up your ability to deal with carbon dioxide okay when we when we breathe the urge to breathe does not actually come from a lock, lack of oxygen it comes from a buildup of carbon dioxide okay okay so that's the main brain trigger for you to breathe it's not actually yeah. got to do with oxygen mm -hmm. yeah so even if you know if you're if you're uh if you have one of those pulse oximeters, yeah, mm -hmm. and you you test it at sea level, yeah, you're always in around 95 to 99, right, mm -hmm. percent. So even if you do, like the harder and harder that you do like breath, uh, sorry, training, that will decrease a little bit. So you become more tolerant. So your oxygen consumption or your oxygen will go down. Yeah. After right. yeah. after a long period of time, right? Um, or you're at at, uh, at altitude. Okay. If you can start to deal with carbon dioxide a little bit better, then you don't need to breathe as much. You become a lot more efficient. Okay. okay. And you're doing more with less. Wow. Okay. We do that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds. Tell me why. Yeah. This is a, I mean, this yeah. sounds like hugely beneficial, especially for something like the marathon. 100%. Endurance events. Yeah. Because when you're breathing, and if you're breathing way too much, where is that oxygen going? Is that where stitch happens? And just... Potentially, but even even more broad. broad. Well, as, as in your, if you're breathing way too if fast, you if, just, if, is it just 
basically going straight back out. <laughs> exactly. All right. So when you're breathing, okay, actually, let's do this little experiment. So if you put your ha uh, right hand on your chest, your left hand just below your belly, right? So when you're in your marathon or like long distance and you're breathing through your mouth, take a deep breath through your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Now take a deep breath through your nose. Okay. Now which hand move more? Take Oops. a big breath. Really try and fill it in with your through your nose. Now through the mouth again. So your mouth is your chest. Yeah. Okay. So your mouth yeah. is directly related to your stress response to your upper chest. Right. And your nose is related to your diaphragm more. Which is weird because I think as runners, certainly when you're running hard, you breathe through your mouth. Yeah. Automatic, okay. Certainly automatically. Automatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now there's a rhythm issue with that. So let's let's pull, pull away the rhythm. I'm just throwing that in just as a bit of wild card for later. Okay. But when you're breathing through your mouth hard, okay, where is most of the air staying? It, up in your chest. Okay. Not where the gas exchange is. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Or less. It's always going to there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not that much. Yeah. Now, if I'm breathing really intensely, also, that is very, very energy consuming, not only in my legs, but for my breath. So if I'm breathing loads, I'm actually using a lot of energy to just breathe. So I'm really inefficient. So one is the air is going here, like on your upper chest and not in the, it's called dead space, right? So it's not going to the area where it's actually, you know, having the gas exchange. Now, mouth breathing for sure at very high level, for sure you need to introduce it because you have um, less resistance. So you're getting more ventilation, but it may not necessarily be um, respiration. So you're not able to, you're not able to, to use, use it, it or, right? right? Okay, it may be in your blood, great. Okay, but it's not, if it's not going to the tissue, mm. it's not working. Yeah. Can you do both at the same time? Can you like? Can you do? Breathe through you, halfway through your nose and half, kind of get the top up through your mouth. <laughs> like um, what's the optimum? You, actually, you could in a certain uh, frame, but let's go, let's, uh, let's start at your, the start of your marathon, let's yeah. say, right? And if you, the best way to kind of approach this is like a gears response, right? So the best, uh, what will keep your heart rate down is breathing through your nose, okay? Because you're actually getting 20% more oxygenation of your tissues by breathing through your nose versus what, your mouth. Why does it feel like you're not getting as much in? Okay. It's not satisfying. It's not satisfying, but you're also probably not super tolerant to carbon dioxide. Okay. So that carbon dioxide, what you're doing by breathing through the mouth and breathing out through the mouth is you're offloading a a load of carbon dioxide. Okay. So that's your like, oh, I need to get rid of this, right? Mm -hmm. so, but let's go back to the start of the race and you can start to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Yeah, ideally, right? Because this is the best way to breathe. There are, you know, exclusions to that, but let's say in general, breathing in through the nose, out through the nose is the best in terms of oxygenation of your tissues, okay? Then it starts to get harder. Okay, and you start to breathe more rapidly through the nose, more of like a, a, an, uh, an input on the inhale as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, so your pace picks up. Okay, so that's, let's say first gear was like calmly in through the nose, out through the nose. Second gear is more of an input through the nose, more of an input through the nose, okay? Then as your pace starts to pick up, then you go in through the nose, out through the mouth. That shuttles off a lot of the carbon dioxide that you feel like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when it really gets tough, then you start to really go, yeah. Okay, so in through the mouth and out through the mouth, <laughs> if that wasn't clear. Um, so, but it's gears, right? And the longer you can stay in the lower gears, the less stress on your system and the more efficient you can be with less. So when you're in the higher gears and you're yeah. breathing in and out through your mouth, so you're in the higher stress, can you still control that in a way that keeps it 
less stressful so you're kind of you're not doing those shallow fast breaths but if you do it deeper it's better remember that phrase relaxation is in the exhalation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really having control of your exhalation tells you a lot about your state even if it is a yeah but if you can really because oftentimes when you come to let's say an end of a race and you got like you know people are you know chucking it for the for the end you know they're really pushing it (sighs) yeah Uh so they will have they will lose control of the exhale and the inhale so there's no control at all but if you can if you've got two people coming to an end of a race and one has a focus on the exhale or has the ability to um, control the exhale they're in a far better state they're going to smash the other person easy (sighs) yeah wow it's amazing just how much it can affect kind of so so many physical elements and and performance Mm -hmm. and what what about recovery as well because if we can if we can downshift our system into that parasympathetic system does that again have an impact on like um, um, at a muscular level 100% in terms of repair and restoration yeah and what we don't do as athletes and I was very much you know very shit at this as well um, you just train and then you leave without down regulating first if you can down regulate your body's already like okay start the repair process let's go yeah but even even more basic than this okay what is the most basic movement your body does? Breathing. Yeah, still. Yeah. Oh, oh breathing. which one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, That's if, you've not me, sto- <laughs> if you've stopped breathing for too long, that might be a bad sign, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, <laughs> too relaxed. So the most fundamental movement is your breath. Yeah. Okay. And you're doing this 20,000 times, 15 to 20,000 times oh. per day. Yeah. If it's shit... <laughs> Sorry, guys, the other, all of your other movements are going to be not so good. Yeah. <laughs> what, where's a good place to start working on this? Awareness of breath is crucial because that will give you an awareness first off of your body, which we're very lacking in as a, as a society. Um, I'm getting better at it <laughs> over these past couple of years. It's been interesting. And there's still times when I'm like, completely lose my body and I'm just like it, like it's a taxi for you know my body's a taxi for my brain and my thoughts um, but breath awareness is really crucial and just checking in for short periods of time during the day or changing your breath for short periods of time so that could be less than a minute you know just changing down regulating from let's say a higher respiratory rate to a lower one or shifting states like for example uh let's say after lunch you might have that like you know oh, i gotta go back to work or you gotta do something then you can change your breath and change your state quite quickly in terms of alertness yeah mm. awareness is crucial now if you're really talking about uh about performance as well the, there's four aspects of breathing that are super important so there's the biochemical yeah, so certain aspects, carbon dioxide and oxygen, right? There's the biomechanics. So if you're, I'm doing this right now, okay, or if you're at a computer or something like this, you're hunched, can you take a good breath? No. 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 And if you're taking a crap breath for the majority of your day? Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Just think about it, right? Yeah. Just throwing it out, right? Yeah. Uh, there's rhythm of your breathing. And um, so these are aspects that, you can change and I'm really trying to dial in in your question but the awareness is is key Mm. so what would that look like is that just I don't know setting a timer for five minutes and actually just really focusing on your breath less a minute minute or doing short breath holes that will increase your carbon dioxide tolerance because you guys are you know into running and performance and whatnot so that's a huge thing for athletes how would you build up with that if I like start today with some breath holds how how would you suggest building up in a way that's I'm not going to pass out but <laughs> no and it has to be incremental yeah. and slow because your body is not going to respond otherwise 
Yeah, okay. But even try something like this, right? So what you're gonna do is cup your hands together and put them over your nose mouth. Yeah, and you're gonna breathe through your nose. So you're gonna, you're gonna cover it. You're, there's still gonna be air that goes through, but just try this. Okay, and just notice how that's going. So we're doing a bit of a Darth Vader breath here. <laughs> so you may initially find there is a bit of restriction and you have to breathe a little bit like, ooh, this is a little bit of effort. Okay, now block one nostril and keep it going. And it's a little bit harder, isn't it? Okay, so you really have to focus and be there with it. Relax your shoulders if you can. Good, now re release that and then notice, notice how you breathe. Just in through your nose. It's a little bit op more open oh, now, yeah? Oh. Okay, a little bit easier to breathe. A lot easier. Yeah, now try the other one just for the crack. So you may notice <laughs> that one is harder than the other, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. One is more blocked, one is more open. Good, and then bring it back just to normal. Now you should notice that it's a lot more open. Okay, so those first initial breaths might've been a bit uncomfortable, especially when you block, block one no nostril, you're like, I'm not gonna give <laughs> yeah. enough, yeah? And so this is essentially training your carbon dioxide super quickly. Wow, okay. Because what are you doing when you cup your hands? You still allow air yeah, in. Yeah, but reducing, you're breathing the air you breathe out. Rebreathing carbon yeah. dioxide. And so you're building up that tolerance and you actually start to go, oh, okay, this is what, it's stressful. And then, you know, make it harder, walk around with it. You can start to uh, change it. Yeah. But that's a, a good one. And also breathing less, like specifically breathing less, but like lying down to start. Yeah, no, that's, that's super helpful. And, and on the topic of performance, how do we combine that with the cold exposure as well? Cold exposure. How does cold exposure, how can that help with performance and recovery? Um, well, first off, it will change your breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you cannot do well in cold and breathe stressfully. So you start to really be able to downregulate your breath automatically. Yeah. If you don't, you'll get out. <laughs> yeah, and it will be a miserable experience. Mm -hmm. But if you start to you start to learn how to like pull the gears in, yeah, and like change it. And then in terms of cold exposure specifically, wow, that's like a whole new world that we could also open up in terms of what you can do pre, post, recovery for, you know mental focus and clarity and being able to deal with stressful situations but also knowing that your body in order to perform has to be in a certain temperature window so if you want to hack that system you can hack it with cold exposure so for example to give you something tangible let's say you are going for a run Right. And it's not in, let's say, competition phase necessarily because you're training this this way first. Um, one of the limiting factors of your performance is when your body temperature rises, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, it gets too much. Yeah. Then your body stops working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you can buffer that a little bit if you get your body temperature cooler to start. Okay. That's just as a suggestion, right? Especially for runners. So once you like limber up your joints, then you can actually get cool and let's say give yourself a, I don't know, 20, 30 minute uh, window and then you go for it, for your run. So you're starting off at a lower uh, heat, mm -hmm. uh, like a body, a core body temperature. And then you have a little bit more wiggle room to get to that point of heat exhaustion, yeah, where, you're, where certain enzymes in your body don't start to work mm -hmm. because you're at a higher temperature. Um, also, in terms of recovery, it will reduce inflammation. But if you're specifically doing strength work, I wouldn't do an ice bath afterwards. Why is that? So when you're doing strength, you're necessarily creating inflammation. Yeah? Yeah. You want your body to have the inflama inflammatory signals so that it goes, hey, we need to get stronger. So you're breaking your muscles to a certain degree. And then with all of those inflammatory signals, your brain goes, oh, okay, I need to ditch this in this area, this in this department, yeah. etc." Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you dampen that uh, message, that those chemical messengers, then 
uh, you're less likely to gain strength. Okay. And muscle. Is that, is that not the same with running to some degree? Actually, is it, this is something I've always been confused about as yeah. to when you want the inflammation and when you want to get rid of it. Because obviously in, in training, we have a similar response in that we we create inflammation mm -hmm. but it's and some different of that, to strength exactly you're not so breaking some, the muscle, so exactly i don't know if you are maybe you are yeah so uh, yes and no so some of that uh inflammatory response will be adaptive and mm -hmm. you will get used to running in that way but generally it's less about growth of muscle and strength of muscle, I hypertrophy, so like uh, your your muscles getting bigger mm. than recovery. So, but also going to that recovery point, you want to recover more when you're in competition. Yeah. Okay. You 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 want to dampen the the inflammatory signals when you're in competition, as opposed to when you're training. Yeah. Now you still mm -hmm. might want to use that occasionally during training. Don't get me wrong, huh? good for them you know good f to is that just because the recovery is more important than the adaptation and competition but exactly in training you actually want the adaptation you want the adaptation yeah. and and that is more more specific though to strength work yeah okay yeah um as opposed to running per se yeah yeah because you're still getting the motor commands and the control and the learning from that comes from that in the training phase but in the competing phase or performance phase, you really want to dampen the inflammatory response. Okay, interesting. And with, so in a training block, is there any time when it would be really beneficial to use an ice bath or cold therapy? Like, I don't know, maybe if you run in the morning and then use it in the evening or use it even before training? Before training is really good. Okay. So you're getting all of the, the you know, it's it's also stimulating, you know, you're getting the dopamine response, you're getting the adrenaline response in the morning, for example, or like earlier on in the day. Yeah. And you're also getting the circadian clock rhythm to your sleep if you have it earlier in the day than in the evening. And then you go train and then you don't necessarily dampen the the inflammatory response, especially if you're in the gym it's less less so in in running but bear with me yeah so and then and then you you train and then you sleep and your body is going oh okay i need to recover this area this these these guys need to go to my legs and and whatnot yeah so i think before training can be a really good time to do cold exposure in your training block if listeners are going to try this themselves number one does a shower a cold shower have the same effect in the morning because I know a lot of people will start the morning with a cold shower and how cold does it need to be both shower and the bath if I had a, a like if I got a pound for every time anyone said how cold <laughs> <laughs> I would be rolling in it right now so it is different right a cold shower is different to uh, immersion full immersion because you're losing uh heat in different ways so the shower uh you don't build up a, a little a buffer around you so when you go into a cold bath you have like a, a little um layer of like a thermal like a like a a, a thermal you're like wearing the cold you're wearing the cold right <laughs> yeah and so it keeps you in that uh, temperature yeah now with the shower you're getting it's like running water right um, but obviously you're not getting like complete full immersion. Um, both are useful. They will both get your adrenaline up. Um, they will both change your breath and you can start to learn how to change your breath um, to deal with that stress. Uh, but the main thing that I would say for people wanting to explore this is go really slowly. Mm, okay. okay. If your body is not ready for these stimuli, because it is one of the strongest stimuli you can do to your body is to put it in a cold environment same with actually changing your breath if you breathe in a stressful way it's one of the most stressful things you can do so to go really slowly into it just ease into it after a warm shower you know knock on the cold for just a couple of seconds and see if you can start to down regulate your breath 
okay, what what will happen? <sighs> yeah. Okay, so you're initially going to get that huge um, like inhale. So actually playing with uh, exploring, like uh, trying to change it, but on an exhale. So it'll be a far different experience than doing it on an inhale, right? Um, but really going slowly and listening to your body. You know, we have this, we love like numbers. I used to love numbers and, you know, like have you know, all the trackers and all this kind of stuff. Now it's really an appreciation of, ah, okay, today is challenging. Yeah. So for example, if you give an example of a person who takes a cold shower on one day, yeah, on Monday it's 10 degrees and on Tuesday it's 10 degrees, right? So you're thinking temperature wise, exactly the same, same time, same everything, right? But if I slept like crap, on Monday night, my Tuesday experience is completely different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't so feel like 10 degrees. It feels colder mm -hmm. or it feels longer or. So what would you do on that day? Would you listen to your body and be like, actually, I'm going to do less? Or is that kind of opportunity to control your mind? Both. And push through? Both. So sometimes there is an opportunity for you to push. And especially if you're, you know, if you're going, oh, OK, this is the this is the re this is what I'm aiming for you know mm -hmm. especially if you know we're all like people who like goals and whatnot and we're like you know i'm not doing i'm not not doing it yeah and so but it's understanding that oftentimes we just you know it's like like we we completely we go for the things that are super easy to measure measure time temperature you know all of these things we think oh okay must be the same but if we can start to tune into our body, we can actually go, oh, that was really hard, but I did it anyway because I wanted to do it anyway, mm. as opposed to just going, I need to do this every day, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, two minutes, five degrees, whatever. Yeah. So is that where the dopamine comes in? Is it because I've, I've heard, I've read that ice baths increase deep dopamine, but it gives you like a really long lasting dopamine. Yes. And from my experience, I so I started doing them for actually re firstly recovery and B because I was really crap in the cold and yeah. I was basically sick of whinging about the cold and I was like I need to just Snap. man up and, <laughs> and deal with this somehow so I'm gonna do ice baths to harden myself up and actually I've kept doing them because I feel so good afterwards yeah. but I'm not sure how much of that is like the physical effect from the ice or is it because it's challenging it's something that I didn't like doing and actually each time I get in I'm like I've done it. It's probably both. But there is a physiological shift that happens when you're in an ice bath that will raise your dopamine. Interesting. Just like irrespective of what you're thinking, what you're whatever. Yeah. As long as you can calm yourself into the circumstance. Right. OK. Yeah. So it's very linked to the breathing. Yeah. But just in general. Right. Because your body has to give off these things because it is a challenging circumstance. <laughs> mm, okay yeah 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 but there's also the mind component of thinking oh, I did that go me you know and both can raise your dopamine obviously the the good thing with uh so cocaine also raises your dopamine um but and chocolate and many different things but what normally happens is you have a high curve so they they raise it high so they raise it above your baseline but then you drop mm. real, real, real quickly. OK, whereas when you go into a cold bath or a cold shower, or a you just a short dosage. Yeah. So the dosage is key. Um, that will that effect will linger a lot longer. So the curve isn't as uh, is like it isn't as much of a V as more like a long, long, and mm. mm. <laughs> is it like a like a hard training session as well because i guess it sounds like a similar thing that your body's going through something challenging so it it has to. itself yeah and then psychologically afterwards you're proud that you've yeah completed the challenging thing and so you, you feel show good me. you go go <laughs> and, me and that lasts a long time after yeah. as well it's kind yes. of a similar thing yeah. yeah and so you're you're naturally going to be releasing these things the thing is with the cold you can probably get there a little bit quicker Good hack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if if so if people are into this and, and want to build up, is there a 
kind of is there like a time in cold that we should aim for to get the maximum benefit and actually if you go beyond that is there a time when the benefit drops off and you're just in there pointlessly yes um it depends though what you're shooting for because there's many different goals that you can achieve in the cold many different outcomes and depending on your on your circumstance will depend on what kind of protocols that you would want to go in there's also a principles over protocols approach to the ice bath but there, it's a bit more specific right so there is diminishing returns after a certain point but the the diminishing returns are when you can't recover okay so for example uh when you get into a cold bath or cold immersion and it takes a little while for your body to come back to normal temperature it will heat up inside right because the engines have to go um, the challenge to me, to you, to everybody who does this is how quickly you can recover back to a baseline. So mm -hmm. for example, if you're struggling uh, to warm yourself up like a few hours afterwards, you've clearly gone too long, right? You really want to warm up as quickly as possible doing certain movements where you're engaging the bigger muscles in your body, so like your quads and your glutes. So doing like slow squats or something like this to get your core temperature back okay, as yeah. quickly as possible. So instead of saying how cold, how long, la la la, the most important thing is how quickly can you recover? That's a, an incredible way of assessing how good your nervous system is to adapt, mm -hmm. to shift. Now, the longer th stuff that you do, in cold it's a lot more mindset and if you're training that specifically well then you start to push those physical aspects but if what you're doing in the cold is not assisting you in the goals that you're looking for whether it's performance or recovery or whatever then you really have to question your performance or your 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 motor your the way you're structuring it yeah less is better and just noting oh okay it took me three minutes to come back oh it took me five minutes okay and then realizing ah oh, okay that's all right but if it's longer and longer then you just decrease the amount of time that you're in the cold unless you're going for the world record unless you're going for the world <laughs> if you're training if you're training Which to do the, out. yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> two <in> hours <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um but you don't want to so Okay, a few rules of thumb, okay? For every minute that you're in cold, you want to do at least three minutes warming up afterwards outside. Okay. Yeah. So that's not putting like clothes on straight away because otherwise you're just creating a fridge, which those winter swimmers don't know about, mm -hmm. some of them. Um, so a one to three ratio at least for warming up afterwards. Yeah, so just let your body warm up naturally. Warm up naturally by moving it, by yeah. doing whatever it is, okay? So it's from like the inside out. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, so you're creating that heat from inside, yeah? Mm. A few other things. I mean, as a general rule, you could look at it in the following way. So let's say it's 10 degrees water. You could, now, if it's not your first time, but if you're more experienced, you could do 10 minutes, okay? If it's five degrees, you could do five minutes. But then again, read back into, did I sleep poorly last night? How's my recovery? You know, you guys have all these, you know, probably devices for HRV and all of that. You can assess that in different ways through your breath and other things. I don't think we have time for that today. So 10, 10 degrees, 10 minutes, five degrees, five minutes, two, two. Now, when it comes, when you're way more practiced with it, then you can start to explore more. But that's kind of like good general guidelines for safety, at least. And then use it as a tool just to really understand your body. Mm -hmm. And it's like super surprising what you what you find. Even those days, you know, where you're like, oh, it's going to be really challenging. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, actually, that wasn't so bad, you know. And it mm -hmm. completely is a huge um, mood shifter, huge... Yeah, just completely shifts your state. It, yeah, I can I can totally attest to that. And I'm already sold on it. And I have to say, I haven't done much breath work, but now I'm sold on that. You, ha so, you have to. 
The yeah, work is, is, yeah. is it's wild. Thank, I mean, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom because L- literally, I think this isn't even... we've convinced. Yeah, we need to do a whole other episode. Yeah, we I think, need to do. Us, we need to do a series. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's so much for people to get started with yeah. and get their teeth into. And I'm sold on the breathwork. Steph will be getting in on ice bath. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. So excited. <laughs> but we have a closing tradition on this podcast where we ask all our guests, what is your high five me moment? So a moment in your life, whether that's in your professional career or just general life, where you would give yourself a massive high five. Gosh, that's a good one. Being Irish, it's actually, it's really hard to give yourself high fives because <laughs> we have a culture <laughs> of like, no, 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 no. It wasn't good enough for it. No, no. Um, but now I'm getting really, like I'm a recovering Irish person. Um, <laughs> there's a few. Ugh. I like that. Oh no, there's definitely, it's, but yeah, it's funny. I'm like thrown back into my tennis days at this point. There was this one match um because I was playing for a university team in the states and uh I was the clincher on the match and that's just one thing that I'm like yeah high five right now in this in this current moment many high fives but that was that was pretty cool I was like the 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 fourth point and that's that was awesome. against one of our biggest rivals um but probably more high fives since I've started doing this stuff. Uh, just even like personally, like in relationships and life and mm. all of that stuff, the hard bits. Well, that's amazing yeah. how much it's impacted your life. Yeah. Positively. Yeah. It seems Help like such a simple, is. simple thing. I mean, breathing yeah. is something we do all the time without yeah. thinking it's so simple and yet it can be so impactful. Yeah. It can. <laughs> so keep breathing, folks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Anet, for joining us. Yeah, it was a good crack. Thanks for joining us for Five Miles Easy. See you next time. Ooh.